In recent years, perhaps the last couple of years, we've seen an increase in the amount of knife crime, um, particularly amongst young, young people. And at the moment, we've got over 300 young people that we know are involved in serious youth violence across Bristol, so I'd say there's quite a few. All you ever hear about is thugs, teens, hoodies, carrying knives, knife crime, people being stabbed, and I think a lot of young people carry knives because they're scared that someone else is carrying a knife. My brother, basically, uh, when he was 13, got chased by a uh, male with a knife. And then what happened? And then basically he went to school, the school did nothing, the police did nothing. Then he uh, never dropped out of school, never went back because of, he was just traumatised or whatnot. And then that led to like him going out with his mates, committing further crime. And then went to prison. Listen to the story. His name was Jay, was looking for that pay. Couldn't keep his demons at bay. Got himself in a tight spot, tied up in a knot. People were on the block, trying to take a shot. Believe it or not, this is not hard. You'll be rotting in a cell. Live in hell, stay up on them rails. Better for your health. I am Harvey. I was part of the initial knife crime animation project funded by Avon and Somerset Police. I am making this documentary to investigate the key causes of knife crime, to understand the public health response to knife crime, and to find out how we can come together to break this cycle of violence. Uh, why have the police funded the knife crime animation project? We funded it because uh, this is a problem that we want to engage and work with young people in solving. And actually, if we're trying to solve a problem which involves violence amongst young people and a minority of people who might be tempted to carry a knife, then actually it would be sensible for us to talk to young people about what they think the solutions are, what they think the messages we should be putting across should be. majority of young people did not feel comfortable engaging with the project or putting their names to the animation because it is funded by the police who they do not trust and would not turn to for help or support around this issue. How does this make you feel and what more do you think needs to be done to address it? Personally it's very sad. I feel very sad and I feel very disappointed that young people don't feel that they can trust the police. But if ever there was a stronger message that we have to do more in order to encourage that trust, that's got to be it, isn't it? We have to go out on the streets. We have to go to the places that, that the young people go to if we want to have a really coherent message comes from everyone that's engaged in this. A young man has died tonight as a victim of a stabbing. It is believed that he was carrying a knife and it was used against him in the attack. Our correspondent reports. Hey, wait, is that a knife? It's for protection. Just, just don't worry about it, right? I didn't tell anyone. Here's my friend. 100% from my findings that I've found so far, it would be for protection. Um, nine times out of ten, the young people are saying, I only carry it for protection. They're not looking at going to, um, to do or cause harm to anybody. So it was just about educating them in, in the sense of actually, if they're carrying a weapon, they're more likely to get hurt themselves. Social media does play a big role in um, the possible increase in not just knife crime, but in bullying and kind of gang related activity. So like people were saying that um, certain, if fights are happening, they might put something out on Snapchat and then suddenly you've got loads more people getting involved with, a, with kind of either stirring it up um, or then maybe that fight or that attack is filmed and then it just, it's like another cycle. So then there's a bigger retribution because then someone wants to kind of get their own back and then that might also go out on social media. I think it's, it's social media can be really dangerous um, if it's used in this sort of way. I've been excluded from two schools um, like multiple times. It impacts your mental health um, like your men like, and it like brings you to the people that are naughty even more and then you go out with them. Me and my mate like timed it so we get, went up to isolation at the same time, got excluded at the same time, went out and then just did whatever. We find a lot of young people are groomed because um, they're not in school yeah. so they're more vulnerable to groomers but also through alternative learning provisions you yeah. find 
you know, the groomers know where to find these young people. Yeah. So if they're not in school, they're more likely to be involved, I'd say. There's this kid uh, that got excluded. Then because he was, uh, uh, that he had no support and like he was kicked out and like, basically the school was like, washed his hands with him. Like they just, he went out, committed an offence and went to prison. Put down the knives, ready the game, worth a son as one kid from a hood, let on side a car. You came from a bar, guess what happened next? Stabbed him through the heart, his friends were vexed, looking for revenge. They got it in the end, that's never the way. Listen to the story. Uh, I think they could work with us more, not send us to isolation for a whole day for not having a pen or not having a pencil and like not having the correct trainers or whatnot. Like, that's the stuff that I was getting sent to isolation and once I get to isolation, I was kicked off because I'm not spending the whole day in isolation for the, these petty things. I'd rather get excluded, go home. Exclusion should always be a last result unless there is no other reason or no other alternative. But even with that, I would suggest that it's got to be some solid plan in place so that those students don't fall into the hands of those who are waiting to take advantage of them. We don't get enough like warnings or assemblies about this stuff. So and not, not enough support. Please don't address this stuff enough. Mm. And if they did, like they need to do it in a calm way. Mm. Like, you know, don't get all... Intimidating. Yeah, intimidating. Yeah. Actually, sometimes enabling young people to have choices about how they interact with an adult is, is is really precious um, and having control of a situation when often they don't in their own lives. Having like youth clubs or something but actual like interesting ones. <laughs> yeah. For people to feel like safe mm. and comfortable and just like trustworthy people. If you look at when um, some of our youth centres were closed down yeah. and then over time how this has become an issue you can see there's quite a strong correlation there because what would tend to happen is those young people would have always had that safe space to go to and those trusted people to speak to about issues and a lot of that's gone. If young people are eight years old and they're going to their local adventure playground and they spend doing they do that for like four years and then they're able to go on to youth projects throughout their teenage life it creates this support network around them that helps them to make the right decisions or to go to somebody when they do have a difficult decision to make. Build their self-esteem, build their confidence, build their self-belief in themselves that actually they can achieve and they can do things and actually they're a really nice person. You know, so we try and bring out all of those elements for them to look at their futures and think, do you know what, I've done some stuff in the past and maybe it wasn't the right path and try and divert them into a different path that will that will be inspiring to them, that they can inspire other people. And it's just seeing the best in young people. It's not enough funding for the youth today. No support, sending them off to war. They don't care, they get locked up in the cage. They've already been isolated, violated. Chuck to the side, wonder why they're frustrated. Trouble passed, think that could be related. Need long-term solutions, less prosecutions. Kids, life are more than institutions proven. There's room for improvement. Put down the, the one thing about youth workers is it's a voluntary relationship. So actually that is key. That relationship is fundamental to how we do our work. Um, and that will be a different type of relationship to a social worker. It will be a different type of relationship to a PCSO. So if you can get all these elements come together, then actually we should be able to support that young person or the groups of young people in a more sustainable way, I think. The Violence Production Units is something that has been a, a really good, inspirational idea because it's bringing together everyone, whether that's police, health, education, community leaders, uh, about how to tackle uh, serious violence. And this isn't a policing issue, this has got to be something that's tackled by everyone in society. The knife crime side of things, we haven't had as much focus on. Um, so, and particularly around the educational part of that. So there might be a focus on reducing knife crime and actually the crime prevention, the proactive side of it, but the actual, um, the side of it where you want to sort of prevent and go in and educate, that's sort of been maybe not as focused on. So I think that's why the VRU is quite key because it, it solely, its sole job is to sort of focus on those key areas. So some of the work is looking at uh, prevention kind of stuff. So that's more around going into schools delivering workshops on more um, issues around knife crime, grooming, county lines, um, 
baths, things like that. Um, and then we do kind of early intervention work and intervention with young people who we know are involved. Yeah. And what we've done is <clears throat> got a scheme called Community Mentors. So this is about working with people from the community who've got a bit of that lived experience so that they're more likely to engage with the young person. To make life changes with young people is a slow process. And um, I would love to see that, you know, maybe actually people are commissioned to do three years with young people, at least minimum. The government have started giving pots of money to address this, yeah. but as I said, it's still not enough. Yeah. So it, what we're trying to do is make sure we involve the community in any solutions that we come up with so it is sustainable, because at some point the Home Office will cut the funding and they'll move on to something else. There'll be a different yeah. issue that needs solving. The moment you can change yourself, the moment you can change the world, but I realise that your walls shine at pros, even when life swirls violence. It's not the answer, love and peace is what we'll capture, ready for the rapture. Seems like we're always going through the same cycle as vital. The council should be listening to the young people who are on the street, who are living this, who are going through this, who are worried every time they step out of their house because they're worried if that group of boys over there is going to do something or whatever. So. I think we all as professionals need to listen to you guys because it's you guys that experience this more than us. Um, I really hope that there can be an outcome and I think things like this will go a long way to, to do that. So I think what you're doing is really good. If it's an adult driven agenda, what we end up is lots of adults deciding what is right for young people and change won't happen like that. Rather than being, I think with young people being told to do something or this is how you should do it, they're going to more kick back against that will actually, if they're part of making this film or just generally a solution. I think they're gonna be more passionate about it, more believe in it more because they was part of the process. And I think that's what I think with young people, if they're part of the process, you're gonna have a more engaged, you're gonna have a more believing in what they've done. Now that we're trying to do more to help, I'd like to see it sustained and not just be one big thing and then put to bed until something big happens and then we can go back to it because that's what I'm seeing now and that frustrates me. We talk about it, we don't do anything about it until one big incident and then we carry on and do all the fanciful things we like to do until we're tired of it and then we just stop until the next thing happens. So. What I like to see is if we're going to tackle knife crime, I don't just want to see a video shown and then stored somewhere as a file in the library. We all have a responsibility. So the media has a responsibility. Um, so is teachers, so is members of communities, so is community leaders. So it is everybody, not just the police, not just the government. We all have a role to play and it's about how we play that role together. What has become clearer to me over the last nine months is the more police really listen and engage with young people in positive activities, the better the relationships are. This project has given me a voice and a chance to learn. We need more. Most importantly, young people living in deprived areas are the most at risk of getting it caught up in knife crime. It feels like we are excluded from schools, communities and life in general, more than anyone else. If there is to be any chance of solving knife crime, we need to be included. Seems like we're always going through the same cycle, it's vital. We gotta break that cycle, not end up like our rivals.